Hey guys, welcome back to Multispective. It's Jenica here, your host of the podcast. Today I'm here to share with you a new episode where I interviewed Danielle James. She's a wonderful, free spirited, and really resilient individual who talks about her childhood being raised in a very conservative and patriarchal city in the US. She wanted to break free from the kinds of lifestyles that she was living, as she didn't believe in the ideologies in her community. And so she decided to leave the US and start traveling around the world. Now, in in that time, she decided to work in a weed farm where she found that she was at most peace and happiness with her lifestyle there. So she worked in a weed farm for over five years and we, we delve a little bit into that part of her journey. Well, I had a friend, a weed farmer, and learned a little bit about it and I was like, oh, this is pretty interesting. And then I realized how calming it is working with these plants and everything and it's a lot more than a lot of people think. Unfortunately, in that time, she met with a tragic accident that left her with a traumatic brain injury. So she had to learn and relearn how to walk, how to talk, how to navigate her life. And she chose to do it without any kinds of medication. So she chose to heal and recover with yoga and with other kinds of alternative methods. So, you know, really inspirational story, another story of resilience through adversity. And I can't wait for you guys to listen to this episode. The first two years, I didn't even feel like myself. I didn't want any medications. I wanted to feel what my body needed. And so I had to relearn how to walk and then how to use my brain. For those of you that are really enjoying the podcast, thank you so much for all of your support. Please continue to share Share this podcast with your friends and loved ones and do drop a comment letting us know what you feel, what you think, and if there are any kind of stories you're looking for uh, going forward. And we will do our best to try to find those particular kinds of stories for you. So once again, thank you so much for all of your support and uh, enjoy the episode. Hi, Danny. I am so excited to have you here on Multispective with us. How are you doing today? Good. Thanks for having me on here. Yeah. So Danny, you mentioned uh, off the record that you've done quite a few podcast episodes. Can you tell us a little bit about that? <laughs> yeah. Um, so I've been on multiple podcasts, mostly talking about my traumatic brain injury and how I overcame that among talking about traveling because I'm a travel blogger and I've been to over 20 countries now as well. So Wow, over 20 countries. That's amazing. Yeah, That's awesome. Is there anything in particular that inspired you to start traveling? Or was it one place that you went to that made you want to do more of this? Yeah, 100%. It was one place. And my friend, who's my husband now, uh, brought me, invited me on a trip to Peru. And this was the first trip I had gone on to solo um, out of the country, out of the U.S., when I went there, I was so amazed at how beautiful it was, the culture, the people. They're so friendly there. And the experiences we had there are so unforgettable. I mean, we learned how to fish fish with machetes. And we caught eight fish doing that. And we stayed in the Amazons for three nights. Um, and we were there during the rainy season. So every night we had to move. Plus, we got to see one of the tour guides we were with just jump in the water in the middle of the night out of the canoe and came back into the canoe with a caiman, like a little alligator. And it was like, what? I'm just saying, where's the mom? <laughs> like, <laughs> what? Uh, wow. So, yeah, it was an experience that definitely all the experiences that we had in Peru and Bolivia were amazing. Wow. I can't, I can't wait to delve a little bit deeper into this um, because I'd love to know more about your travels as well um, and, and sort of the ways that it impacted you too. Um, but let, let's just sort of like go right back to the to the beginning, to baby daddy. Tell us a little bit about, you know, your childhood and where were you raised? And Well, <laughs> yeah, that's definitely at the beginning. Okay. Um, I was born in Dayton, Ohio. And I grew up in outside of Sioux Falls, South Dakota. So I definitely was around the mentality of women in a different category than men. Um, and yeah, it was definitely farmlands and things like that is what I grew up with. Right. What do you mean when you say women on a different level in men. So when I was growing up, at least living there, 
um, many men saw themselves as having to be the workers, the ones that bring in the money to the house. And then the women stay home and uh, make the food and take care of the children. That was kind of like the normal thing there. And mm. me being me, I definitely wanted to fight against that all the time. Um, and I remember my father would always say, oh, you're just a girl. You're you're just a girl. And I'm just like, oh, that doesn't matter. So when I mm. turned, I think, 17 or so, um, my dad had a roofing company. Um, so I worked for him on the roof for a summer because I had to prove to him that, hey, ladies can do this too. It's not just guys. Mm. And then I showed him. And so... He, he he got a bit angry about it. So he had to go up on the roof and try to work. And this is when he's older and he doesn't work on the roof so much. So I was so scared that he was going to fall off the roof because he's not used to doing this labor. And yeah, it's it's hard work. But he had to prove to me, I guess. <laughs> right. Living in the patriarchy. Um, did you feel like it was... Um, a lot harder to like for things like getting jobs or like wanting to study further or if you decided you didn't want to get married at the time or you know do anything that would typically not be what kind of a fight was that did you did you have like siblings to sort of like were on the same page was or was it basically you all alone trying to fight this yeah, it was basically just me. I mean, I have a half sister and brother, but our age gap is 11 years. So I definitely grew up like an only child. And I definitely could get the feeling when I'd be talking to certain people that they'd look down at me because I'm a woman. And it at some points, it would be really hard to have genuine conversations with some of those people because just of my gender. And that alone was, it's always been difficult. So nowadays I live in Sweden because my husband's a Swede. Um, and here I could see how different it is with that. I mean, here mm -hmm. I don't get that feeling at all. Um, definitely mm -hmm. equal on the same level as a man. And I can see more and more of all the things that I grew up with that I didn't realize were bad. But now living here, I'm kind of like, huh, yeah, that's not so good. And it's like things I even noticed with some of my friends because I grew up with a lot of guy friends and just the, some of the things that they did. Now I realize, oh, it's because I was a girl. <laughs> and it, mm. I don't know, having that realization, it it's kind of sad. I mean, it's good I have the realization. It's just sad to realize like, oh, so a lot of my guy friends were kind of sexist as well. And it just was something that was accepted because it was part of the culture there. What were some of like the beliefs uh, back then, like in terms of like with marriage or kids? Mm -hmm. I think they saw like, oh, you have to get married, have kids and settle down. You don't like as a woman your future of a career is kind of non-existent. Um, and so me being me, I am definitely a very unconventional person. So I definitely took a way different route. Um, I moved to Northern California and became a weed farmer. <laughs> and wow. I did that for five years. And that's where I met um, my husband, <laughs> wow, that's amazing. And how much of a fight did you have to put up to be able to go to California and, and sort of have that life? Um, I just went on a road trip with my sister and we butt heads. So I ended up hitchhiking for a year. <laughs> and then I ended up in the in the meeting certain people. And then I ended up working on the weed farm. And then, yeah. <laughs> wow. Amazing. I love that. <laughs> uh, I just want to go back a little bit to the community that you were raised in. How diverse was it in terms of race? When I was growing up there, I think it was mostly white people. Um, I mean, there were other races there as well, but they were very limited. Mm. There wasn't so many. And I think that racism was a huge issue as well. Mm. Um, and nowadays, there are a lot of different colored people living there. 
Mm. Um, and I know that there are also a lot more crimes happening now too, because a lot of the people have been moving from like Chicago and have been moving to Sioux Falls. And I think some other big cities have been moving there as well. Right. Do you believe, or do you think that with the diversity of race has also affected the diversity or the mindset of like women in the community there and the society there? I believe so. Um, mm. And plus this is so much time has passed now since I grew up there. I mean, I'm 34 years old. <laughs> Sorry, I had to think about that. <laughs> and, and yeah, so I mean, that's a lot of time to pass. So I hope that their mindset of women and race has definitely changed. I mean, from my friends and family that I still have there, it sounds like it has changed. Right. Um, how many of those friends of yours that you're in touch with have sort of gone, gone against the grain versus, you know, actually follow suit and conform to the societal norms? Oh man, I, I don't really think any of them have stayed with the norm of being the woman that stays at home. Um, a lot of my guy friends, I've actually lost contact with. I only have a couple of them still as my friends. So the ones that have actually stayed around and still have contact with me are my girlfriends. And mm. those ones, they seem to be all really good, hardworking women. Um, so that's probably why they're my friends too, is because they've always kind of been a little against the grain. <laughs> right. No, I love that. Do you feel when you go back, like to an extent, like I don't really fit here and I don't really want to fit here anymore? <laughs> yeah. And I think that usually goes to how much I travel and I travel to all these different countries. So it blows their minds. So many of them, because I mean, U.S., the Americans are very much known for not traveling internationally so much. And some of those cities and towns you visit, they don't leave their <laughs> city or town. Mm. <laughs> yeah, no, that's interesting. Would you consider yourself to be a feminist? Oh, 100%, yes. <laughs> I was going to Tell say, me about that belief for you. Yeah, yeah. When I moved to Sweden, I found that they had a political party called Feminist Initiative Political Party. So I went and talked with them. I found what they stood for and that they were genuinely for equality and um, everyone having the rights together. And I was like, yes, I'm a part of this. So then I was a part of the group while it was going around. Uh, and happening and helped them with movements and things like that. Um, unfortunately, now it has kind of fallen uh, apart because the leader of it was, she's, a, she, she's an older lady and she was just tired of fighting anymore. <laughs> mm. But I mean, that was great to find and to be a part of. Um, let's talk a little bit about the, the weed farming, like that lifestyle. How did you get into, I mean, you talked a little bit about hitchhiking and then finding this, um, stumbling on this. Is this something you'd experienced before that made you sort of want to get into it? Or was it totally just uh, absurd to you? And that's what made you want to get into it? Like what, what interested you about this in particular? Well, I had a friend um, from Sioux Falls, South Dakota that was down there. And so I actually met up with him and saw that he was a weed farmer and learned a little bit about it. And I was like, oh, this is pretty interesting. Ah, And so I, that's how I got into it. And then I realized how calming it is working with these plants and everything. And it was really nice doing this kind of hard labor um, and watching these grow. And it's a lot more than a lot of people think come with it. It's very tough work and there's a lot that comes with it. Plus you get to be in the nature if it's outside, which it was for us. And where our where my property was, I didn't have reception. So it was definitely a great time for me to self reflect and just be with my dog and myself and the plants. <laughs> like, was it a pretty big team of people working together? Um, so let's see, I, I did it for five years. So at first, I was just a trimmer. And that was not for me because I have ADHD and trying to focus on just one little thing for such a long time is just 
Oh, it's so hard. <laughs> <Mind numbing. laughs> <laughs> yes. So I ended up turning into a weed farmer and that is something that I fell in love with. And I think it was for like three to six months. It was just me doing all the work. And then <laughs> once the six months happened or so, then there would be about, let's see, 15 people that would come in to help me like break them down. And um, then there would be, I think, 10 or 12 um, of those people would be trimmers that would be trimming all the stuff. And then I would have to turn into a weed mama. And so that meant that I had to make the food, serve everyone, make sure that I weigh everything, make sure everyone's getting the proper amount that they are deserving and all that. <laughs> Interesting. Weed mama. I've never heard of that yep. before. <laughs> <laughs> Talk to me about the legal process of this. Like how legal was this? So when I was doing this, it was when it was in the gray zone. So it wasn't fully legal, but it wasn't fully illegal either. So it's like you were allowed 99 plants um, per property. And um, they didn't have all the documents that they do. Ha they have to have now a days for that. So it's mm -hmm. like, it was just private people that I was working for to do all of this for. Were you ever worried about like, um, yeah, all of this, like what would happen? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, but I had my dog with me that helped because we had black bears that would come, mountain lions. Um, there were also sketchy neighbors. Um, the area that I worked, the they were known to have some tweakers around and the, the property I worked on had a pretty scary past that involved people trying to come in and steal and used a fire torch and threatened people. And yeah, so it has a, I, I had a gun on my hip 24 uh, seven and we had um, little sensors throughout the property as well. So then if one of them goes off, I would go check and stuff. So. <laughs> wow, that's dangerous. I, I'm, I'm, I suppose that, you know, for quality purposes or whatever, you would have all had to try a little bit um, of, of weed yourself. What was that sort of experience like as well for you? Oh, so like, did you feel a sense of connection with the, with the work that you were doing because of the way that it was affecting you as well, personally? Mm -hmm. Well, personally, I didn't really like smoking weed and I've never really liked it. I mean, of course I tried it because I grew it and everything, but it just wasn't for me because it, it, it put my body in too much of a calming state. So then it was hard for me to do work. <laughs> um, right. And I also like to have my head in my game. I like to be fully there if I can be. Um, mm. And that was not so plausible when uh, smoking weed. <laughs> Interesting. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the head injury that you, you sustained? Yeah. Um, so I mentioned the Peruvian trip. This, the head injury happened, I think, a few months after that trip. And it was, I was leaving Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and was on my way to Northern Cali to work on the farm. Um, so I was in Wyoming, and there was black ice on the ground. And I was like, ooh, this is kind of dangerous. So then I went and stayed at a hotel for the night, me and my dog. And then the next day, I woke up and started on the highway. And I was like, huh, I think they would close these off if it was truly that bad. Well, it seems that's not the case since I came up um, to a seven car pileup or a six car pileup and my car became the seventh and it was a semi it had blocked all of the lanes and all I remember is going, oh shit. And I must have went on autopilot and tried to veer off or something. Well, black ice, you slip on it. You can't really stop. So mm. I ended up clipping one of the vehicles, uh, which turned my small truck into a sardine can because it took the top off. And what ended up happening is it gashed open my head and then it did a whole 360 with my truck. And so the back of the truck was also hit. 
Um, yeah, so it was pretty bad. <laughs> um, mm. My dog was thankfully safe and okay from the accident. Um, the sheriff that had found me was going to be retiring in, I think, a couple weeks after. And he said that this was the worst accident he had ever seen and the most blood he's ever seen out of someone who had somehow survived. Um, he initially thought that I was dead when he saw me on the scene and that I must have moved or something. So he realized, oh, she's she's alive. And I was grabbing my head and she, he said that I kept saying, my head, my head, um, and blood coming out. Um, and since it was so cold, I was lucky that I didn't have to have a blood transfusion. So it helps keep in the blood since mm. it was so cold. I had to be helicoptered to Salt Lake City, Utah, and get help there um, from all of this. Um, and I was in ICU for 10 days. They had induced me in a coma. And yeah, so a bit, a lot. <laughs> that is intense. What was the procedure then, like the surgeries that were to take place after? And you were in this coma for how long? Uh, I think I was in the the coma for three or four days. Um, and um, when my parents got the news, I, I remember my father telling me the story that the sheriff or police officer came to their door in South Dakota. And once he got the news, he dropped to his knees and just it was the end of the world for him. Um, and my mom, she was very calm and collected because she, she's a retired nurse. So she's like, okay, well, let's get our things. Let's pack. Let's go. So they drove. And my best friend, Nicole, had come, went with them as well. And she was six months pregnant. <laughs> uh, oh. So they all came to, they drove to me. And I think after a day or so, they were there with me. Um, and I, I actually didn't have to have a surgery. Um, I, yeah, I don't know how that happened but for some reason, I didn't need a surgery. I didn't need blood transfusion. So it was more, I had two concussions and two bruises in my brain from the accident. Um, and once I did come to, my equilibrium was crap. <laughs> I couldn't really stand. Um, I could, but I couldn't keep stay up there. Um, if it was dark, I would fall over. Um, so two nurses... Yeah, two nurses had to help me shower and had to help me around for a little bit. And so I had to relearn how to walk and then how to use my brain. Um, they gave me a lot of, I, I call them common sense tests because like they put me into um, a kitchen and they had me turn on the oven and make sure that I turn it off, make sure that I use hot pads and things you don't really think about that we do already subconsciously. Hmm. That is so scary. What parts of the brain were affected though that took that caused the imbalance and the um, you know, all these like motor, fine motor and gross motor sort of skills being affected? Yeah, I'm not really sure which part. I just know it was like the frontal lobes that were hurt and then the back was also hurt. So I'm assuming it must be one of those that plays a huge role in the whole <laughs> imbalance and everything else. Right. How long was this recovery for you? <sighs> um, I think it was at least after five years, I started feeling as recovered as I was going to be. The first two years, I didn't even feel like myself. I felt like there was a huge piece of me missing and I felt lost, frustrated, and a bit foggy in my head. So that was mm -hmm. very difficult. Right. Did the doctors tell you that this was, you were going to be able to make a full recovery at the time or were they sort of skeptical or just sort of, let's just take it a day by day? I think it was more that they wanted to take it day by day. But um, as I recovered as much as I had after the two years or so, they were all breathless at how much I had recovered. So I'm pretty sure they thought that I was going to be pretty messed up for the rest of my life. 
was all of the recovery sort of um, taking place at most of the recovery taking place at the hospital with physiotherapy or were there sort of things that you were doing at home as well to help? Like what were the things that you were doing to rewire that brain and kind of yeah. reconnect the synapses? <laughs> yeah. So let's see. I was in ICU for the 10 days. I had the test there. And then after that, we drove to Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and I stayed with my parents. And I had physical therapy and many tests with doctors for, I think, a month or two. And what helped me the most was the physical therapy. And uh, something I had mentioned at the beginning of all this, that I didn't want any medications. I wanted to feel what my body needed and I didn't want to take something that would take away the pain. So I would overdo it because I know how I am. I would have overdone it and then I would end up hurting my body for the long run. And so the, the most, what I would do for the pain is I would use ice and if it was really bad, then I would turn to Advil. Otherwise, sleep was my go-to <laughs> with healing. Wow. <laughs> That's amazing. And you didn't even consider things like alternative medicine, like stuff that's not your typical Western, you know, addictive yeah. painkillers and stuff. Yeah. So I actually used CBD oil for my body, like for my back and my neck, because I would have horrible pain with that. And that helped me tremendously. Right. That's really admirable, though, because for something like this, you know, even doctors recommend it. And it's, you know, so severe, the pain that, you know, you managed to hold back from from all of that. It's not an easy feat. Yeah. Um how did you stay positive through the whole process? I mean, it was five years. Yeah, I think it was that I kept seeing my future like, I'm not going to be stuck like this for the rest of my life. I am going to be similar to how I was before. I'm going to be able to do more work in one day. I'm going to be able to do a hike and not have such pain. So I just, I kept pushing myself. And I think that's what was it. Of course, there were days where it was like, so hard to push forward, it was so painful, or it's just my brain was just done for. But I kept doing it because I could see that I didn't want to be like this. And <laughs> I'm stubborn. So I also couldn't, I couldn't admit to myself that I'm, I was like that either. <laughs> Yeah. And then yoga helped me loads as well. What would you say was like the, the biggest, toughest experience with this brain? Was it, was it related to balance? Was that the, the thing that was the hardest thing for you? I think the hardest thing for me was not feeling like myself. It's just not feeling like I'm in my own head. I mean, those first two years when I didn't feel like myself, Everyone felt that I was going to be stuck like that for the rest of my life. And they felt pity for me and felt sorry for me. Um, I had friends that thought that I was acting like I was a teenager again. And at the time when this accident happened, I was 24 years old. So acting like a teenager again, that's quite a shift. Right. And um, they would be saying jokes or things to me. And I just, it wasn't clicking. I just wasn't getting it. And it's things that I usually would laugh with them about or something, and it just wasn't happening. So it's, right. it, it, yeah, I didn't like that feeling. So you would say it was kind of like a little bit of a shift in, in your personality to an extent, right? That you oh, couldn't control. Yeah. It's like you could see it. You knew it was happening. People were telling you that you're different, um, but you couldn't really connect with that. That's really interesting. Mm -hmm. Were there other things like behavioral things that were affected like your speech or, you know, memory or your emotions, that kind of stuff? Yeah, it seemed that I seen I would get triggered uh, to get angry faster than usual. And my patients were worse than usual. And my patients are usually already bad. <laughs> so adding mm -hmm. that was just it's very difficult. Um and then the whole acting like the teenager, um, laughing and being very immature and things like that was happening, which wasn't normal for me. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's interesting that the doctors 
were not able to tell like which part of your brain was affecting these kind of changes in you. Like according to the scans, it was that your brain was more or less healed, right? Well, I think they maybe had told me at some point at certain spots, like they knew when you have trouble reading which part of the brain that is focused on or writing or speech. Um, but I think it gets a little more confusing when it becomes mental it w- stuff within you. Then it's kind of a bit more on the foggy side when it comes to the brain. But, you know, they maybe had told me some of the places that it could be possible. I just can't remember <laughs> exactly. Right. Yeah. Oh, were you married at this point? Or oh, no. See, no. <laughs> oh. oh. Yeah, it was actually, I think, around six months after my accident that I got married. And when my parents had found out, they flew right to Northern California to see who this guy was. <laughs> mm. And they probably thought that, oh, she's not, she's not right in the head. She's marrying a stranger. So they had to come real quick and then they met him and they were thankful that he's a genuine good guy. Right. And how long did you know him before you both got married? Let's see. I think I, overall, um, once we were married, I think it was a year. So it was pretty quick. Um, Although we fell in love when we were in Peru. It was just, we never were true to each other when it came to those feelings. And then the accident happened. And I think both of us were like, red flag, we better do something or she almost died. Like we need to be Um, true to each other. Yeah. How was he in terms of like supporting you through the healing process? He was amazing. Um, So after the month or two of uh, doing my physical therapy and getting massage, my massage therapy, chiropractor stuff done in Sioux Falls, I went back to Northern California to start working. And my friend, who's my husband, was there. And he could see how damaged I was and how much pain I was after working for an hour. So he would push, put me to bed and say, stay there. <laughs> and then he would go work in the fields and then I would sneak away and go work in the fields. And then he'd have to find me again and go, Hey, do, 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 go back to bed. <laughs> and so he'd have to put mm-hmm. me back to bed. And so he started getting really good at watching movies and shows with me when he was just trying to make sure that I was resting and taking care of my body. Cause he could see that I overdo it even without any medication. I, I still feel like I had to push myself, but he helped me 100% from myself. That's amazing. That must have brought you both so much closer to each other as well. Right? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> yeah. Can you talk to me about the mental health process at this point? Like how, how did you cope? How did you feel a lot of the times? Like how did you express how you felt or, you know, release the trauma or pain that you experienced mm. mentally? Yeah, I think it helped that I was writing down my days. So I was kind of, I write in more of a story for a story format. So it's, (laughs) it's quite interesting looking back at that stuff to see how I was in those days and stuff. So I kind of get to relive it a little bit in certain um, instances. So that helped a lot. Plus, I think it was just doing the the resting for my whole body taking a nap when i needed a nap that helped me mentally physically in every way and that man of mine helped me so much cuz he kept letting me know it's okay it's okay to rest it's okay you're working on fixing yourself and that helped me get in a better mindset as well right. and yoga <laughs> and yoga that's amazing did you ever feel like you needed to like try therapy or something um like mental therapy yeah like Um, counseling yeah i don't think so um just because i already had in my mind that i was going to get better i already had this mindset that yes i'm i had bad days and i'm going to have more bad days 
However, I am going to get better. Um, mm. So I guess that's why it never came to my mind to even um, think of that, really. And mm. I just recently heard that there's a lot of TBI groups on Facebook and a bunch of TBI podcasts. And these are things I didn't even think of when I was going through this myself to even reach out to. So I definitely was going through these feelings and my body changing and all these things by myself. And I didn't even think, oh yeah, there are probably other people out there that have gone through similar yeah. problems and issues. Right. I guess TBI means trauma brain injury or something? Oh, yes. Sorry. <laughs> um, are you still working at the weed farm right now? Oh, no. That ended, I think, that one year that I went back there after my accident. And then after that, I stopped working there because I realized this isn't what I want to do. This isn't where I want to be. This isn't the person I want to be and all these things. So... My husband and I actually went on a six-month uh, honeymoon in the U.S. on a road trip. So it was us, our two cats, and my dog. <laughs> we finally decided to go back to Sioux Falls, South Dakota to help my family with their business because a huge hailstorm had happened, so they needed help. <laughs> mm. So I, I went back there, and I became their secretary, their material order person, their money person picker upper there. <laughs> I did a lot of stuff for them to help with the business um, to keep going forward. Um, you mentioned that your husband and you are living in Sweden right now. Yep. Tell us about life there. Oh, it's lovely. I mean, I love nature and there's nature everywhere here. They have this one law, which I love. It's Alamans Räten. And with this law, you can go out in nature and camp out there for two nights as long as you're about 800 meters from any building. And of course, you need to have respect for the nature. Don't take any live branches off of trees. Use dead branches if you're going to make a fire. Don't litter. All the things that uh, come with it. That's really cool. So this is like uh, to live a bit primitive? Is it to have a ex primitive experience? Yeah, I think it's to help people connect more with nature. Um, so they have this law. Uh, there are just certain places that you can't ca camp at, like nature reserves or national parks. Um, they have designated places that you can camp. So they're just trying to preserve the land. Um, otherwise, yeah, you can. There, <laughs> there's possibility to find someone um, in a tent on your property if you have a lot of forest or something. Um, as long as they're, you know, the right amount away from you. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Could that potentially be dangerous, though? or So know? since their culture here is a lot different than in the U.S., um, they it's very common to have a neighbor walking on your property just to go on a walk and then they leave and stuff. So it's, it's really common here and it's part of their culture, which when I first moved here, I, our, our property that we're working on a renovated house, it is, we have to take a neighbor's road to get to it. And so I'm always, I was always a little scared, like, Oh no, are they going to shoot us or something like that? Yeah. And my husband just laughs at me because that's not a thing here. It's, you have to go through so many tests. What is it? A, a physical test with guns and then a mental test with guns and then a paper test with guns to make sure you know about forests and nature um, before you actually can have a hunter's uh, license and then a hunter's gun. So it's right. not so common. Yeah, I think it's probably illegal for handguns here and other guns that don't involve hunting. Interesting. And would you say that also like the overall social status there is generally pretty well structured, that disparity is not so wide. And so therefore, you're not around, you know, people that like theft and, and that kind of stuff as much. Their level is pretty much middle for most people. Although I think there is sometimes in certain areas that it is a little bit of a gap. 
in between. And there are some crimes and things like that. However, it seems like that is probably more from refugees that have come in here and they have have they have mental issues from the war and mm. things that they've dealt with in their countries. And so they bring it here and they don't get the help that they need because they are men and they that's seen as a weakness or something. Um, yeah. Right. So how do they ensure safety then for individuals um, in these circumstances? You know, if they can walk around on properties and, and stuff. Well, those those areas that have a little bit more of crime rates and issues, they're more like the cities and stuff. And so the cities, they don't have so much for nature as much as where mm. I live and where I live is more of a rural place. Right. So it's different in that sense. Can you talk to me about some of the traveling? When did this travel, you know, idea come for you and, you know, making a, making a little business out of that? Yeah. Um, so I actually created a personal travel blog journal thing um, when I was in Peru. So that's actually when I started the travel blog, but it wasn't a travel blog then. It was, I think, a couple years later that I actually learned, oh, this could be a travel blog. I could turn this into some kind of business and help others with my stories of all these places I've been. Um, mm -hmm. So that's when I decided to turn it into a travel blog. And then over the years, I have um, edited it and made it more easily uh, user-friendly um, and user experiences for them uh, at a better at a better peak and everything for them. Um, yeah. So I made it easier for them all around. I like that. That's really cool. And so can you tell me about some of the places that you've um, been to, some of the places you've traveled to? Yeah. So I've been to Northern Greece, which when people think of Greece, they usually think of all those white buildings, beaches, and all those things. Well, Northern Greece is where Mount Olympus is, and that's also where there's a lot of nature. Um, there's Papingo Pools, which, oh, it's such a lovely place. It's all these rock formations that have water going through it. There's Vikos Gorge. It's a national park as well. And they have all of these beautiful arches, um, arch bridges that are built. So my husband and I actually went on a little road trip up there and visited, I think, a handful of those arch bridges and a bunch of the nature. So it was, it's spectacular yeah. up there. And it's, it's a little sad that more people don't go to Greece for those places instead of just the beaches. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah, generally we have a tendency to like look for, you know, the famous tourist spots so that we can, you know, uh, post them up on social media and, you know, make it known yeah. to people that we've been to the famous spots, right? Um, but nature <laughs> is a whole other. I love that you were so in touch with nature and it's, it's such a important, you know, aspect of, of your life. Um, mm. was it, was it, around you where you were around it a lot in growing up in your childhood as well? Is that why you sort of really value and appreciate it? I mean, I guess I was a little bit. Um, since I have family all over the U.S., we did a lot of road trips. Uh, so I got to see a bunch of different places in the U.S. when I was growing up as well. Mm. And I think that maybe helped as well with my passion for all the nature. But I think the most that helped the most was probably my traumatic brain injury. Cause it was after that, that I appreciated everything so much more. And we would, my husband and I on that honeymoon road trip, we did, we went to Yosemite national park and I was so amazed at the beautiful uh, trees and nature there. And we did one of the hikes there. And this was the first hike I had done after my accident. And it was right. Yosemite Falls hike. It was probably the most, the hardest hike I have ever done because of the pain I had in my head the whole time trying to go up there. And I kept mm. pushing and pushing, even with the tears in my down my face and having the pounding in my head. I kept going and I would take breaks. Uh, that's why it took me so long. 
However, mm-hmm. I made it to the top and that view was just so amazing. So yeah, I think it was this accident made me realize how important nature is. Right. I love that. Yeah. And that, that you, you know, yeah, during the healing process and the recovery as well, like you really utilized, you know, nature and yoga and like the natural healing methods as well. Um, so I can see why that's something that, you know, you've you hold so dear to, you know, your heart um, ever since then as well, right? Can you tell me a little bit more about um, something that you've sort of like learned from this process or like learned about even yourself that, you know, um, you feel proud of? Yeah. I think from all of this, I realized more of the person that I want to be and Back then, before the accident, I was more living in the now, and I wasn't thinking about the future, really. I was just a party girl, just thinking about the next party or next time to just not do so much, but hang out with friends. And Mm -hmm. after the accident, I realized that I was doing things that I don't care, like, I don't really care about. I would rather be somewhere else and make a difference in the world. And so now I am a sustainable travel expert. So I want to help people learn of when they're traveling, all these good places, eco-friendly places that they can visit to um, have all these different tour tourist uh, places that are more for the nature than anything else. Um, mm. And plus my story of the traumatic brain injury, I want people to see that, hey, I overcame this obstacle you can overcome some as well. You can do it. You just have to believe in yourself. And yeah, I know it gets hard, but you can do it. No, that's really, that's really empowering. I think your story is like, um, one of those, you know, examples of the the few individuals that I've heard of that have, you know, gone through such adversity and physical pain and who's, um, sort of remained resilient throughout the whole process, like not giving up and, you know, always trying to choose the, maybe the bit harder, but the healthier ways of like, you know, uh, coping and managing it and, you know, turning to the support system around you and, you know, refusing the things that could potentially like, I mean, having that sort of vision all along from the get go, knowing that, you know, I value I value my life so much more than this pain that I'm experiencing right now. What are some things if someone right now is listening and experiencing um, like extreme pain or, you know, be it physical or mental health or in any aspect of their lives, um, what kind of quote or message can, can you pass along to them in this very moment to stay resilient in this process? So there's actually... A mantra that I had when I was going up the Yosemite hike and that was slow and steady wins the race and I see that could work for anything really um, especially when it comes to healing you're not going to heal over over the night you have to be patient and you have to be slow and steady because yeah. that's how you'll get better and being positive, that's a huge thing that helped me as well. Of course, it's super hard to stay positive when you're having these pains or you realize, oh, I was like this and now I'm like this. Like I used to be able to do 12 hours of work a day and now I only can do one. You can't compare yourself to how you used to be. You're Mm. never going to be the same and you just have to realize that and accept it and then just move forward, stay positive and just have a light at the end of your tunnel, like whatever goal it is for you. Um, I don't know, maybe to walk straight again, or it could be anything. Wow. Thank you so much, Danny, for today. I really, really enjoyed speaking with you today. If you enjoyed the episode and would like to help support the show, please follow and subscribe. You can rate and review your feedback on any of our platforms listed in the description. I'd like to recognize our guests who are vulnerable and open to share their life experiences with us. Thank you for showing us we are human. Also, a thank you to our team who worked so hard behind the scenes to make it happen. Chris Trzynski, Stefan Menzel. The show would be nothing without you. I'm Jenica, host and writer of the show, and you're listening to Multispective.